Howdy y'all, welcome back to Little Bits, and today we are going to use some printed circuit boards to make some breadboard friendly RISC-V microcontroller units. Now, there's gonna be a little bit of an introduction to RISC-V here, so if you're familiar with it already, or if you understand you know, CPU architectures in general, please do feel free to skip past the intro part. Now, for those unfamiliar, there's plenty of ISAs out there. X86 is the most common one you probably are familiar with. It's what your, what your PC runs. Architecture is actually what's called an instruction set architecture, or ISA. And that is a, dis a specification that describes how you can interface with a CPU. So it's, it's the interface that software uses in order to instruct your CPU to execute tasks. So why are we looking at a different instruction set architecture than the common ones? Why would we use anything different? Well, RISC-V is a relatively young open source CPU instruction set architecture, and it's designed to be stable, it's designed to be easy to use, it's designed to be used by anyone, and it's designed to be extensible, and it's designed to be extensible by anyone. That's a key feature of this instruction set. There are a great many instruction set architectures out there, as I said, and most of them are proprietary. x86 is proprietary, ARM is proprietary, and manufacturers and companies wishing to create microprocessors and microcontrollers using these proprietary instruction sets need to pay license fees in order to do so. RISC-V, as an open source license, ISA is really seeing rapid adoption in the hardware industry as, you know, controllers for logic boards, particularly Western Digital is known to be using them to build um, hard drives. So the logic board on some of the latest hard drives that they're manufacturing, they run RISC-V based CPU architectures. I personally am very excited to get started with this platform and I've invested in a few tools to get started, which you can see here. You know, I have the official Sci-5 Hi-5 Revision B board. Now Sci-5 is one of the companies out there that's really manufacturing RISC-V and pushing it in the industry. And they're, they're the founders of, one of the founders of the RISC-V Foundation who are all working to drive adoption of this, this architecture and this platform. They, you can find these on crowdsupply.com. I believe it's .com, I'm pretty sure it's .com. Uh, they are a kind of crowdfunding um, tech platform that encourages, actually requires people manufacturing and selling hardware on their site to open source that hardware and uh, provide guarantees of support. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's a little sidetracked though. Uh, back on topic, you know, these aren't the only manufacturers doing Risk Five. There's also Seed. I believe it's Seed Studios, and it's three E's S E E E D. I have some of their stuff as well. This is a little Risk Five based AI kit that is a little. I could get started with it, but it, there's some foundational skills that I want to build before I really start tinkering with this too much. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've been standardizing on this particular microcontroller as my entry into the RISC-V world. So this particular microcontroller is called the FE310-G002. It is the second revision of Sci-Fi's hobbyist intro uh, microcontroller into, you know, in this space. Um, there's not a whole great deal of hobbyist tools available yet, but this is one of them. And you can buy these microcontrollers bare like this five at a time for I think $25, or you can purchase this board from Sci-5 on Crowd Supply directly. This is the, as I said, Hi-5 Revision B, Hi-5-1 Revision B, I think it's called. And there's a reason that I really want to try my hand at putting bare chips on breadboard friendly PCBs. And it's because this thing is packed full of features. It has 
another microcontroller on it for Wi-Fi. This is an ESP32 Solo, I believe. It has Sager J-Link attachments, uh, it built in Sager J-Link so that you can, you know, do debugging and stuff. And I've played with that a little bit. It's very interesting, but I'm really just trying to wrap my head around this chip and how this chip works. And working with this board is an entire ecosystem of stuff that you have to wrap your head around. And, you know, it's fun and it's useful, but I want to, I want a more focused experience in my studies. So this is fun. I've been using it. It's taught me a lot, but it's gonna go. This is the Lo5. This is a third party product and it is really cool. And I got it because I thought it was going to kind of expose a more basic user experience to me than the the high five one but this low five is also it's packed full of features it's got a lot of stuff on it you'd, you'd be surprised with how small it is and you know i'm gonna use this at some point and it's got some pins that you could solder directly like you could solder this directly to another uh circuit board that you design for it so actually that's why i haven't used this yet because i don't want to solder pin headers into it of course now that i have a reflow workstation i can probably uh, I can probably solder pins into it and, and remove them later with ease, but that is not really, it's not really working for me. I really want to just expose the pins of this chip to a breadboard so I can just connect to them and start tinkering. So that's out of the picture as well. So then I found these by Adafruit, and these are actually dual purpose. Um, you can, I assume you can only do one side safely, really. Uh, but um, it will handle TQFP packages and it will handle uh, QFN packages. And what we have here is a 48 pin QFN. Um, Adafruit makes other uh, pin counts of these adapters as well. I actually purchased this from DigiKey. They come in packs of three. It's like a little set that you break apart. And um, I have five of these FE310 G002 chips, but I only have three of these. So we're gonna try and uh, solder all three of these and hopefully we'll get at least one good board out of it. Um, yeah, so I am going to do not only reflow soldering because I just purchased an 858D uh, reflow soldering kit in order to do this project at all. Uh, not only am I going to be reflow soldering for the first time, I'm also going to be, this is my first time ever soldering any surface mount components. So uh, wish me luck and hopefully I will be able to actually film it in some amount of detail and we'll test connectivity when it's all done and see if we can actually use these things on a breadboard to blink some lights maybe. So let's get started. So here we are getting started with our first attempt. I have prepared the solder paste. I'm trying to get as zoomed in as possible. You may hear my cat playing in the background. He is a silly kitty. Um, now this is, again, something I've never done before, so bear with me. I do have a fume extractor off camera a little bit. It's gonna get noisy. Um, We'll see if I keep the sound on. I may cut cut the sound out for this part, and I may speed it up. So we'll see how this particular filming session goes. I'm rather new to this process. So let's start up the fume extractor, figure out which way we need to face it first, actually. It looks like we need the pin one right here. Here's our little index dot in this corner. So it looks like we need to put our chip on like this. This is actually the wrong side, isn't it? No, this is the right side, QFN. It just seems weird because it's gonna solder itself to those pins. Oops. Right, you can see the Okay, so first we need to apply the solder paste. And let's be very careful about... Now I've looked this up online 
and watched videos, YouTube videos and stuff myself. And everyone says you can just kind of, ooh, you can just kind of put the paste along. Oh, there it goes. It's coming out. Gross. Get in out of here, buddy. Um, along all these pins. And as long as it's fairly level, then... As the solder melts and flows, it will separate and attach to the pins. Oops, that might be a bit gloopy. First try, so you never learn more than from your failures, so we'll see exactly how this turns out. And apparently it shouldn't be too difficult to repair bridges if they occur. I don't know if that's enough for the middle here, but that's what we're gonna run with. All right, now we're going to set our heat to 140-ish. The melting temperature of this is supposed to be 137 Celsius. Um, I am in the US, I do normally use Fahrenheit, but for this kind of equipment, I don't bother with conversion or anything. Uh, so we're gonna turn that on. Beep boop. And this is all lead free, which is, I don't use leaded solder because F that. Although supposedly leaded solder is actually safer to be around, but it gave me a headache like instantly even with a mask on and, um, but it was definitely easier to work with. This seems like it's not gonna fit right to me, but let's see what happens. Okay, let's turn on this vent. We may or may not need it, but I like to have it around. It's not particularly good, but it's better than nothing. And it's gonna be noisy. Here we go. Letting it get up to ten. Just put the air on it. It's warm still, so that's a pretty bad job, it looks like, but I had no idea what to expect with that. Um, sort of melting pretty easily around 200 degrees Celsius, it's still hot. Uh, we'll try to repair this one. Uh, I picked it up and it removed the pad underneath, but I don't think that's a pad that needs a connection, I think it's just there for stability. So. This is probably salvageable, but uh, you can see first attempt is very much a learning experience. I'm going to examine this board a little bit off camera and we'll try to fix it and uh, we may just move on to the next one, so we'll see what happens. Moving forward. Try that again. All right.
I think we're gonna get bridges on this one too, but you know, I saw, the, now that I think about it, the people I saw demonstrating this technique were also cleaning it up with uh, copper thread, whatever this is called, solder wick after the fact as well. So maybe if you just, if you aren't using a stencil, which we're not doing, maybe this, just how this goes. I'd rather have a bridge to clean up than no connection at all. This little green mat gets hot, by the way. It was actually lifting up a little bit. But it went back to shape after... Place this... Give it a, a whirl. I think that's good. We do have bridges here as well, so we will have to clean it with solder wick again. up with a little alcohol and well actually you know what I'm gonna solder pins to I'm gonna solder header pins to this one. Let's compare them. In fact they don't look too bad, you know? Um facing the right way. Uh, they look like it. You know, these might work. Uh, we'll definitely have to see. Let's sew the pins up to one. And... Alright, let's, uh, let's solder some headers on this guy. Put a little flux on everything, because that seems to help. It's my cat tinkering, knocking around the uh, camera there.
can tell I'm much more comfortable with this <laughs> this type of soldering. Um, definitely not like pro or anything, but it's much more approachable. See, I'm glad I got my little fume extractor here. It's not like a true one. It doesn't move it outside of the house, but it does keep it out of my face and filter it a little bit. The trick is to put heat into the the pad and the pin, and then the solder melts onto it. The solder moves towards heat. So the idea is not that this is hot, it's that it's pumping heat into the components that you want the solder to melt and connect to. Melt to and connect to and flow around. Which I'm sure some of you watching understand that. Turn the tip a little bit. It's actually a new soldering tip. I'm not very used to it yet. I know I said I'm going to do one, but I think I'm going to knock out the other two. Because then I can test all of them. I'm actually not sure how I'm going to confirm the connection um, oh hands in the way sorry everybody uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to confirm the connection on this one uh, well, I wonder how much of that footage is unusable uh, my hand was right up in the way Headboard friendly Sci-5 microcontroller unit. Potentially, if it works, we shall see. Alright, let's try a different thing on this one. Uh, this is going to be a little harder for me, but it may prevent me from dropping so much of the action. Let's try Turn this tip a little. Alright, 
I don't think I like this uh, soldering iron tip very much. the heat into the pin. Put the heat into the pin. Into the pin. That's what I want to see. There we go. Okay. I think I'm getting the hang of this one. By this, I mean my uh, little vent fan that you hear running. Uh, yeah, I get it. I just wasn't using this very well. created a bridge there. I think there is a bridge here. No, maybe not. Okay. That looks good. It's going to cool off a bit.
people get their cleaned up with a little alcohol and you know I, I might have said before I really don't know how I'm gonna test all these connections for sure um, if I touch the pad and the pin with the continuity meter then I get a beep you know the pad and the pin are very clearly connected with this trace but uh, I have no surefire way other than plugging it in and trying to make all the pins output something to be sure that these pins are all actually connected on the chip. So far we have two of these soldered up. I'm going to finish the third one, which I tried to solder and messed up on. Footage that I may or may not leave in, so perhaps you know that already. Let's fix up that last one. Alright, this one, like I said, had a little damage or whatever. Um, let's fix it. Just gotta touch the tip of the iron first, it seems like. And then it spreads into actually helps spread the heat into the pan in the pad once it does that. I'm used to using a more fine point uh, one and surprising how much the technique can change between different different shapes of, you know, wedges of metal cones of metal it's, I mean it's not a drastically different technique but you gotta learn where the where the heat's going to place everything, so about that. There's a fair amount of intuition involved in just figuring out how to spread the heat correctly and evenly and quickly and efficiently get that solder on there. But it's actually fairly easy, you know, once you kind of get the hang of it. And I'm sure, like, I'm sure plenty of you watching have done this, so, you know, if I sound patronizing, I, I try to take a, an educational perspective with these things, so, you know, if, if this is something you know how to do and you're comfortable with, very happy to hear that, but if this is something you find intimidating or think that you can't do, which I for a long time did, did not think that this was something that would be accessible to me, that I would be able to figure out how to do soldering and circuitry and hardware design, um, it's, it's really a lot more approachable than it at first seems, at least in it at first seemed to me. There's a lot of good resources on it and you know I feel like tools like Risk V like this are really going to open up uh, this world to more and more engineers, more and more new students. Because if you want to design yourself a CPU based on this and like 
bring it to market and commercially manufacture it, you know, you're not beholden unto anyone but yourself and you know, your vendors and partners in that process. But in this case, you get to skip the vendors and partners where you pay just for the right to, to manufacture something that people already know how to manufacture. So assuming the chips are actually connected to these pins correctly with the reflow soldering technique, and that I'm able to actually access each and every one of these pins, uh, I'm pretty confident with the header pins. So, so here we have them. I cleaned them up with a little alcohol, as I kept saying I would. Um, now there's an egregious error on all of these and the entire time I was working with them, I was, I knew something was wrong. I knew that these chips did not seem to be the right size. They didn't seem to be drawn to the pads the way they should. The flutter, did, the solder didn't seem to flow. The flutter didn't seem to sew, uh, the way it should have. So you know, I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure it out. And the culprit is this. This is seven by seven millimeter, also known as a 0 0.5 millimeter pitch. And these are six by six millimeter packages. So we have the wrong adapter boards here. Now, I hope this was still, you know, kind of good demonstration of how to use reflow soldering, how to solder these kinds of things up. But uh, I think I'm gonna end up removing these chips. I did look online, I feel a little better after seeing that actually this is a very common adapter board that multiple people manufacture this kind of, this pitch, this millimeter size for this package. But the uh, 48 pin six by six millimeter adapter board the, the, I only find one that's being manufactured and it's $14 a pop. I think I paid $5 for all three of these. So, um, the fact that it's a little rarer makes me feel better about making that mistake. But, uh, yeah, these are not going to work. And I knew something was wrong. You shouldn't be able to see this much of the pad after, after soldering these things on there. So this is literally, uh, one millimeter by one millimeter smaller than these boards can accept. Um, so yeah, in any case, uh, I hope it was fun. I did definitely say that we never learn more than when we make failures. When we have failures is when we learn the most. And uh, this is a simple mistake that could have been avoided, but at the end of the day, we have a video. So, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we will get some different adapter boards. I'll probably try my hand at this again with the correct adapter boards. It might take a little while because I really don't want to pay $14 for each of these. There are other options available like um, socket adapters where you can just pop the pop the, the uh, chip in there. I'd really rather have something like this though than a socket adapter um, because I, I do want it to be permanent and yeah, let's uh, consider this lessons learned um, and move forward. Y'all have a great day.